well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Shane O'Neill. I'm a Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences here at Keele. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome you all to this Grand Challenge Lecture and to welcome Professor Bev Skeggs, who's going to speak to us tonight about how do we challenge the stealthy world of digital surveillance. But before I ask Bev to come up and do that, um, first of all, apologies for the change, rather belated change of, of room, which was necessitated by Keel has been very, very busy today. So many thanks to all the staff who've, who've uh, facilitated that, uh, much appreciated. Um, and then a little bit of housekeeping. There are some toilets in the reception area out, out here. Uh, if the fire alarm goes, the nearest fire exit is where? <laughs> oh, right there. Um, and the assembly point is by the Italian at Gardens, which is out beyond, beyond there. Um, so it's a, it's a particular pleasure to welcome our speaker this evening, uh, Professor Bev Skeggs. Bev is no stranger to Keele. Following her undergraduate degree in sociology at the University of York, she, she came to Keele uh, uh, to do a, a PGCE, and she completed a, a PhD here as well. And I'm reliably informed she made some lifelong friends and colleagues on the way, which is true. Um, uh, Bev is currently the director of the Atlantic Fellows Program at the LSE. She's one of the world's foremost feminist sociologists, her book, Formations of Class and Gender, from 1997, has been profoundly significant in drawing attention to the intersections between class and gender inequalities, as experienced by working class young women dealing with the vulnerabilities of daily life in, in harsh conditions. Her more recent work has, in, has involved working on sociology of values and value as an ESRC prof professorial fellow. Her work has shown how contemporary ideas of the self implicitly discriminate against many groups, women, ethnic minorities, migrants, economically disadvantaged, and so on. Uh, and they're seen to fall short of the assumed values of control and, and autonomy that prevail. Bev has explored the source of these values through pioneering studies of traditional and social media, reality television, and Facebook. Bev has published widely and, in addition, has been head of two of the UK's leading sociology departments at Manchester and Goldsmiths and transformed British oldest sociology journal, the Sociological Review, with whom, which we have a very close relationship here at Keele, obviously, into an independent foundation devoted to opening up critical social science. Bev sees digital tracking and trading as one of the major ways in which inequality is being forged continuously in today's world. And in tonight's lecture, she will ask, what is to be done to take control of the digital world for the first time? So, delighted to welcome Bev Skeggs. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me and having me back here. I do love Keele. It's a brilliant, beautiful space, wonderful university, and I really benefited a lot from being here. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. Where's Joe gone? She organised it all. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. So I'm going to go through a lot of slides. I'm very happy to uh, give Joe a copy of the slides so that if anybody wants them, they're very welcome to have them because you'll see why when I get to the conclusion. People need this information. So I'll go through quite a lot quickly and I'm not going to read out a lot because you can read it much more quickly than I can. Um, and there's a lot of information. Basically, there's a lot of slides so that you have access to the key points that you see, the kind of critical information that I want to send out. And before, um, before we get to the final section on what can we do, which changes by the minute, um, I want to focus on what we actually found when we did tracking and trading, why we found it, how we found it. Uh, and to think about the significance, the significance generally and very much the significance for inequality. So I am going through quite quickly, so bear with me and you can always have copies of everything. So if you read the first sentence... Okay, you've been traded. 
You've been traded. Most of you in here will be high net worth individuals or classified as such. Even if you're a student now, your potential uh, contacts, your influences, people in your lives, your parents, your families, your friends are significant to how much you're worth. So it's potential worth as well as worth now and you are being tracked continually. When we began the research project that I'm going to talk about briefly, you will see um, that it's got so much worse <laughs> or so much more extensive. So every single time you open a web, web page, you are being assessed for your value, your value to advertisers who can then pay on an auction site to put an advert on your page. The key point here is that this isn't just about advertising. So initially it looks like a model of advertising, but actually it's a model of total surveillance. Some of you may have uh, heard of uh, Shoshona Zuboff's new book called Surveillance Capital. I think it's actually more just normal monopoly capitalism <laughs> run by digital companies. But the surveillance, the key to it is it's entwined. We now have advertising companies in bed, literally, uh, in some cases, with government. It's the revolving door and the, the entanglement and the entwining is really, really significant. You can turn your phone off, but really it's quite pointless because it's, you're still being tracked as soon as you turn it back on. You can turn various different things off. When uh, people withdrew from the Facebook platform, it was really uh, interesting because that was logged as particular people who didn't want to be tracked, so they found alternative ways to track them. Um, and when I first found this out, cookies respawn, that's what it's called technically, regenerate, they rebuild themselves. So you might think you've cleared your cookie history, but it's rebuilding because there's so many data signals that can be connected together. Now, I am not a computer scientist. I am a sociologist. I work with geniuses. I consider them to be geniuses um, who find out all this information. I am the person who asks the really dumb questions. And there's something about being confident enough to ask dumb questions, I've realised. So I am the one who says at the beginning of a project, I want to know how much advertising Facebook puts on my page. And they go, don't be stupid, it's proprietary data, we'll never find that out. And of course, for those of you in the room who know how to do this stuff, you can get through and you can find out what's going on. So they did. Um, and we did it legally and ethically, let me say, <laughs> registered as developers. So that's just to give you a sense of how fast it is. You got that from the first sentence, but it gets faster all the time. And the capacity is phenomenal. When I first began the research, I was just focusing on the uh, Facebook itself because it was impossible to focus on them all. Um, but now I realize Amazon is the kind of real one to watch. Uh, first, it was a battle between uh, Google and Facebook. Who's going to take over the world? If any of you read the book, The Circle, um, it kind of gives you that mapping. But now it's definitely, I'd say, just, just watching them in the last couple of years is Amazon's definitely has the power. <coughs> and they have the power because they have the capacity. The capacity to process data is what's completely key. So Facebook, for instance, which is relatively small in comparison, has over 100,000 signals which they experiment with through machine learning algorithms. So you provide signals every time you use your uh, phone, desktop, everything. Uh, every time you have an email, you send an email, your web pages, your banking, the language you use is being monitored um, by machine learning algorithms, not by somebody sitting somewhere doing it by machine learning algorithms and this is part of the problems the videos you watch how you watch them your reactions to particular messages the clickbait that you click through on your location data probably the best form of tracking there is um, your networks plus all your historic data and plus all the data that's been bought from brokers so basically it's very difficult to get beyond this. It's very difficult to not have your data captured. And that is one person's data signal. And I do recommend that book if you can get over the kind of macho posturing in it. It was the man who was sacked from Facebook, their marketing manager, 
Um, and he tells you how quite a few of these things work. Clearly, it's different now, um, but he was very angry. So it, there's a few secrets in there. <clears throat> this is how it all works. And we were looking at one particular auction. Um, but there's, there's so many. Facebook has its own called FX, but there's people like Rubicon. There's lots of people competing now. And a side story of all this is that the whole advertising industry is being reconstructed, but I'm not doing that paper at the moment. Um, programmatic advertising is basically where all your data signals are collected. They're then offered machine learning algorithms compete to see whether they can put an advert and they bid for your browser space to place the advert. And that happens in real time auctions It'll be happening as soon as you go onto a web page. It'll be happening now as you're sitting here, if you're flicking through anything. Uh, you will be, you're being literally tracked and traded as you sit here. And any advertiser who's on an auction site can bid for your uh, space on your browser to place the advert. So they work out how much you're worth. They then work out how much to bid for you. They compete on the auction site. And whoever wins gets the space on your browser. And that's happening in milliseconds, like milli, milli, milliseconds. And it's led to a lot of people saying, what's the point in creative advertising when this is happening? And it's creating a huge problem for the advertising industry. So what I'm going to briefly talk about, because it is now an older uh, project, is the Values and Values project, which was um, funded by the ESRC and uh, the genius behind it all is Dr. Simon Yule, who is a uh, software programmer who designed all the software, but he's also a fine artist. We have the most amazing visualizations as well. So he is the, the brains behind this. I'll just say what we did because lots of people say, what did you do? <laughs> and it was a, a complete challenge. We use lots of mixed methods because we failed at many different things. And then you have to obviously... You know the thing about methodology, the best thing is when you fail because then you work out how to do it. Um, so find, getting things wrong is often very useful. So Simon de designed a Facebook app which provided data from everybody's Facebook feed. We got permission <laughs> from the people we signed up. Um, we then had a plug-in for Firefox browsers uh, called Ad Monitor, and this was all open source. Everybody could get this. It was on GitHub at the time. Uh, all the coding for Facebook has now changed. So even though we wanted everybody to use this coding, it's now completely useless because everything changes so quickly um, and it's protected. We did have to register uh, as developers, and all the people who used our browser and gave us permission to put our uh, plugin on their feeds, um, <coughs> had to sign really complex ethics forms, which we, we learned a lot about, which is really, really difficult to do. Um, and then we developed a device to, un to understand the 200 million <laughs> advertising words that we collected. We did manage to get two servers from the computer science department, which they now want back, and we're like, oh. Um, and then we, did a, we provided a live website of daily visualizations so that all the people who'd signed up could see exactly how their data was being used and who was on their site. Um, then we printed them all out and made these beautiful visualizations because you'll see some of them. They're, they are, I think they're quite stunning. And then we did interviews with our participants. So you're getting a sense of how we, we kind of combine computer science, software development, and um, <clears throat> empirical data. So we've written all about it, and you can read it. Um, and we learned as we went along, really, and it is changing now. So we tell the story, and it's an open access uh, paper if you want to read it. So these are the rhythms of people's interactions. And these, this is a person's Facebook browser. Um, and the one on the left is an intense user, and that would be over 10 metres tall if we printed it out. So we did have real problems trying to understand the data because there was so much. It was a problem all the way through. 
Um, the project began, I thought I applied for funding to understand friendships and social interactions and what difference did social media make to people's friendship networks. And it ended up as a study of capitalism, new forms of capitalism, which I never thought I'd do again. <laughs> but it's like, why is this happening? How is this happening? And friendships just became one of the many things that were monetized. Um, and became less significant in terms of how everything was being monetized. So I did have a question that I began with, which was, uh, is there anything beyond capital? And I asked this question because I'd just finished a project on reality TV, and I thought, you know, when intimacy, suffering, sexual behavior, problems, spots, anything is subject to reality TV, I thought, is there anything left that is safe from uh, being made into a source of entertainment? And actually, no, <laughs> really. And even reality TV, I gave that project up about eight years ago, and even that's still extending into even more intimate areas of everyday life. So that's how I began. And this is just to show you what we looked at, uh, the interaction flows that we were looking at. But what really became significant, we're looking at all the data and I don't know if you can see. Can you see? How, how clear is this for you? Terrible. Terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> because here, can you see where it says where that is happening? The big blue arrow pointing to it. Can you see that? Yeah. That gray. We call that the gray matter. So we're collecting all these interactions. So that's friendships, and we're seeing all the formal advertising, we're seeing Facebook posts, we're seeing Facebook stories and sponsored stories. And then we think, what's this mess behind the Facebook post? And we think there's a problem with the software. We think that you know we've made a mistake, something's going on. But actually, the grey matter is Facebook tracking every single web page that people have been on. So they're not, this was 2013. At this point, they still denied they were tracking people. They said they were just, you know, uh, using their Facebook platform. But the grey matter shows that they are literally monitoring everything you do through your web browser. That is the grey matter, as we called it. Because we were like, what there? What on earth is that? Have we made a mistake? So when you look at that, which is a kind of rhythm of interaction, you can see that there's a lot of grey matter all the time, which is adverts being placed on a person's browser as they're looking at Facebook or something else. So it can be, if you've just got your browser open and you're not on Facebook, Facebook is still behind it. That's probably the best way of thinking about it. They're on you, basically. <laughs> they're following you, they're trailing you, they're tracking you. So we decided we'd look into this grey matter. This is when friendships disappeared. <laughs> we were like, what's grey matter? So we decided to look at this grey matter to see what it was doing um, and who it was on the most. Because we saw a lot of grey matter on some people and not on others. And we thought, what's going on there? Can you see the grey matter now? It's the blue dots at the top. Yeah. So that means that Facebook <laughs> is literally, Facebook, the company, is literally monitoring all your use of your phone, your laptop, or your desktop. They're there. They're literally there all the time. Now, we realize they're there because anything you open, which is everything, <laughs> That has one of those little signs at the bottom, these ones. See these? They're all the trackers. So anything that has those on them is tracking you. So that means every time you buy a ticket or anything, it's there. So that is the point. They are there. They are on your website permanently, all the time, tracking you. And we thought, well, what are they doing? And who are they doing it to? Because some people they were really, really, really interested in. I'll show you one of the maps. But <coughs> at first we thought, we're not studying networks. 
You go to Facebook as a network. It was designed as a network. That's its point. Think about the film called The Network for a purpose. It is a network. But what we realized was networks are really important because the people who have dense, this is a dense network, the one that's got lots of connections, we realize that if you have a dense network and you've got a close dense network, people close together, socially connected, it meant that the people on your network are more influential and they are um, high net worth individuals. So we started breaking down the network to see who people were and finding out who were the tight groups and who were the loose groups. Because those who were loosely connected didn't get tracked as much. Those who were tightly connected get tracked a lot. So then this becomes really interesting because it effectively means that it's the middle classes being tracked and surveilled much more than the working classes when we worked out who our participants were. Now, that's odd because you, that's quite counterintuitive in terms of traditional understandings of surveillance and traditional understandings of how influence works. So we realised, and then it becomes quite logical, they're after the people with the money and the influence. But this is why the entwining of markets with surveillance becomes really crucial. Because it's not, yeah. What do you mean uh, People who are in contact with each other a lot. Um, and are Sorry. Sorry. Uh, people who are in contact with each other a lot and who are constantly on uh, Facebook or on other sites making contact with each other. Yeah, is that clear? Yeah, yeah. So tight networks, and we worked out who they were, and if they were influential with a tight network, they were highly, highly tracked, tracked more than anybody else. And we did lots of experimentation. So the one at the top is a loose network with hardly any interaction, and that's much, much more difficult to track, to follow, and to sell things to because you don't know who they are. So that's pretty obvious when you start working it out, but we couldn't work out what was going on. So this one is just evident, yeah? And so what makes one influential? Um, the number of, the number of uh, followers or likes that you have. So it's usually straightforwardly. Not always <laughs> straightforwardly, because if you look at things like just, we did the Justin Bieber versus uh, Obama, and so Justin Bieber was more influential than Obama. So you actually have to, we started breaking down who was more influential in terms of power and whatever else. But for some people, for consumers, Justin Bieber's more important than Obama. Politically, obviously, Obama's much more important in terms of power, influence, and empire. So, you know, it depends how you want to do influence, but usually numbers. So we did a, a lot of breaking down because we kept trying to understand things and think, what on earth is going? on. So this one is mine and it uh, has a list of every site I was on uh, during a period of time. So I'm a bit boring, you can see here. I'd never been on Facebook until I did this project, so that's probably why I'm quite boring. And as you probably know, lots of geeks never go on Facebook and wouldn't even dream of being on Facebook. So I'm working with computer scientists who don't even know how it works. So that's also quite interesting. Um, but these are the moments, the big circles, and these are all live, so you could hit on them and see what was going on. Um, these are the moments when there is, um, <clears throat> my data has been sold and an advert has been placed on me. So my data was sold when I was looking at a Manchester conference. So it's like, what are they selling me? And I wasn't monitoring what had, what had been sold, but we were monitoring the match and when the match was occurring. So the big circles are when a match is occurring, when they see I'm on a particular <coughs> website. My data is, I do this because it's like how else to explain. <laughs> My data is being traded, sold, I've been auctioned and the blob means that somebody's bought uh, access to my website. 
so they put something on it. The big circles, the bigger the circle, the more uh, emphasis or the bigger the space that they've got. So it's just to show you, these are just to give you examples of how much is going on and a basic idea of how it works. So this is another one. <coughs> which shows all the, the trail of Facebook as it tracks your activity on all the other websites. Now, all the little dots uh, are when it's happening. So in the last one, you could only see big dots. On this one, you can see nearly all the dots. And this becomes a big problem for us because this is so big, we can't get all the dots on. So basically, all the time. Uh, sorry. So that's... That's all the websites on the left that I've been on. Not me. It's not me this time. Um, and then at the bottom axis is the dates and times. So it goes through the weeks. Uh, that's, that's daily, that one. So we, we do it over a period of six months for most people. But that's just a small snapshot to give you a sense of the intensity of it all. And I put this slide on as a joke because here we have, you know, a brilliant programmer on the floor because our data is so big, we can't analyze it on screens. And it becomes a joke because we keep running out of floor and we end up in a room about this big. So we literally had to do it, yeah, with, with what's it, you know, Sherlock Holmes things at one point to try and spot the dots and see what was going on because we had so much data because there was so much tracking going on. 2013, Facebook denied they were doing this. The significance of this, and this comes back to the uh, slide on influence, is that what we realised and why we looked at influence is that for some people, they are being tracked all the time. So high net worth individuals, people with influence. On the left is Laura, and she says I can use her name, world service journalist, tracked all the time. All the time. She's on it almost 24-7, and she's literally having adverts placed on her site and all her data extracted all the time. On the other side is Belle, and she's what marketing classifications call waste. She's not a high net, not me, She's not a high net worth individual. She's over 60. She's on welfare benefits and they are not very interested. And at first we think, oh, this is a really big division. But then we look very carefully at who's tracking her debt companies. She's being sold ASDA and debt. So then we get really worried, and this is why it becomes a project on economics, not on sociology. Because if you think about the subprime crisis, how did that happen? Exactly, exactly. So people were being sold debt when they couldn't get access to bank accounts, when they couldn't get access to education. They were just being sold debt to make the fees. So debt is one of the nastiest, most pernicious forms of inequality generation that we have. And it is the future. Debt is, a, if you've seen David Graeber's book, brilliant book on debt, but loads of very good stuff now coming out on debt in various different ways, good debt, bad debt. Very bad debt is when it's sold to people who cannot afford it, payday loans, all that kind of stuff. So we realise that some people are being subprimed digital subpriming. So that's why all the rest that I showed you was significant because it kind of comes together in this slide and it becomes really, really significant. So basically, to recap, phenomenal machine learning, tracking your every move. And it's getting even more effective since we did the research. Why so much tracking and trading? To make money. So even though we had the, the big blip over Facebook after Cambridge Analytica, you can see it's still you know, beginning to catch up again. It was uh, $471 billion last week. So it's not as if it's really suffering at all. And I'll explain why it's not really suffering at all as well. They have to keep the hype of Facebook is that they sell the best 
advertising matching to advertisers. That's what they claim to be doing, which is the traditional of a hype of all advertising. We're matching you, we can tell you, we can tell what you're doing, we're persuading you. But what's very interesting is that we found, and I was only doing this because I was doing something for uh, IP rights, which is very significant, but um, I saw that uh, Facebook had just, just issued a new patent uh, November 2018 to do even more effective targeting. So they clearly don't have the match right, although it did improve while we we're doing the research, but they clearly want to do it better. And Facebook do have a problem because lots of younger people aren't using it, so they've had to find ways of getting to them without the Facebook platform. As we were talking earlier, Facebook is considered to be mum's net for lots of people because it's where mums surveil their children. So um, that's, that became part of the issue. So we decided we needed to look into the economics of this, not just the sociology of it. And we realised actually they behave like very, very traditional capitalist companies. They do, and I remember learning this in 1979. What are the three logics of capitalism? Consolidation, monopolization, and diversification. Nothing changes. They're doing exactly the same. They're just doing it faster, better, bigger, with no regulation. That's the big difference, and that's what's significant about now. Uh, diversification is phenomenal. They're all around the world. So if you look at things like uh, <coughs> free basics, where they give uh, developing countries a free phone and you can only access the internet through this phone, that means they're getting all your data. Uh, that's the only way uh, you can actually get access to telecommunications as well. And they develop lots of peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments. Uh, <coughs> I bet you didn't know that Facebook Messenger was designed for payments to evade regulation, not for you to message your friends at all. So kind of the slip between sociology and economics is really, really significant. Um, but basically, it's all controlled through proprietary rights, and that's significant in terms of how do we regulate them and control them. And I think we argued in the end that Facebook or any big tracking companies become a bit like water and air. It's a utility. You use it to get access to other things. And so nobody knew that you needed the Facebook platform to access Spotify uh, until Spotify crashed and nobody could get through because, sorry, Facebook crashed and nobody could get through um, to Spotify. So they're all entangled as I will go on to look at. But before I look at their entanglement, I want to point out who are the real evil masters of the universe. Not Goldman Sachs, who are actually a big Facebook backer, <laughs> um, but the data brokers. The data brokers, and I recommend everybody download this free book and anything written by cracked labs, and all the references will be written all over this. Um, the data brokers are just extraordinary. They are, they used to be the very traditional data companies that would run a credit check on you if you wanted uh, a loan or a mortgage. Now they are some of the biggest players in your data and they're selling it all the time. And they're selling it in real time. And they have a huge amount of data on you, which will come from very traditional sources like the NHS, like um, HR data. Um, health data of any kind, government data, national insurance data. They even know if you own a cat, apparently. Um, <clears throat> they know everything about everywhere you go, and they know how you look at adverts, which is really crucial. There's some fantastic research going on at Newcastle University at the moment, which works out where people are looking in an advert to work out how to digitally rechange it as, it's, as you're walking down the street. Now, if you thought that Zuckerberg not turning up in front of government after Cambridge Analytica was a scandal, none of the data brokers would appear before Senate. They just didn't bother turning up. They're very, very powerful. I can't go, I could do a whole lecture on them, but I'm not going to. But um, have a look at this report. They're really, really beyond regulation until we had the European Directive, which does control them in Europe but we may not have the European Directive for much longer. 
Um, so this is, and I recommend, because obviously this is going to be difficult, can't move, uh, this is going to be difficult to see, um, there's so much data on it, I recommend you look at the cracked, the, it's called cracked labs, cracked lab sites, and it shows everything you're being uh, monitored for. Do you have a happy face when you look at your phone? Are you scowling? Are you miserable? It's got all your affects captured. Where do you look if you've got a smart TV? When do you walk away from adverts? Uh, it's just got everything on you. Uh, so owning a cat becomes a bit kind of history, really. So <coughs> Axicom has up to 3,000 attributes on you. Oracle sorts people into loads and loads of different categories. Facebook has the advantage of having the history of all your social behavior, your friends, your influencers, your networks. But... These have all the other data, and it's the putting together of all the old data with all the new data that becomes really, really, really significant. So again, I'm afraid if you can't see this, this is this. I thought I'd put these on because they're kind of good images, but if they're difficult to see, um, <coughs> this is how how companies identify people, and they're all trading this data. So the data, your data, it's called the Silicon Valley gold rush. Your data is considered to be the new oil, the new gold, the new whatever. Nobody really knows exactly what people do with it, but we do know it works to sell you things or to stop you receiving... Um, Benefits. Say if you're in America and you've got a trackable phone or a Fitbit or something like that and you have an accident, they will use it to measure whether you should get insurance or not. So when you see local councils in Britain advertising free Fitbits and things like that, be very, very careful. If it becomes connected to private health insurance, you're in trouble if you're not walking enough. So these things will become connected. These things are very important and they often get them wrong. So that's also significant. So data brokers plus Facebook is really, really worrying. So Facebook has all your social data, data brokers have everything else. And then you have GPS on top of that. And then all controlled, and now Facebook has access. If you have used Facebook, have clicked on its permissions, so most people have when they originally went on Facebook in 1984 or whenever it was. Um, and they're very rarely, it says, up oh my goodness, if you use automatic updates, take it off now. Because that's where they have to keep re-asking for your permission. But if you do automatic updates on your phone, you don't have to keep re-asking for permission. So the European Directive should control data brokers to some extent. But if you've already given them permission in, say, something like a credit check and you've got automatic updates on, you keep giving them permission. But we'll come to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so basically, you need to kind of everything is being collected. Financial data, we think, is going to be the most important thing at the moment. So... The octopus structure, as I call it, but maybe octopus isn't right because it's got tentacles, and I need like I need more octopuses, like multiple octopi being all locked together. And so I think it's really funny that the biggest tracker in the world, Google, has only admiration for Amazon. They got there first, they figured it out, and boy, did they! Amazon is expanding at a rate that the other companies can't even compete with. It's into everything: grocery, cloud. There's a joke that they'll start delivering, you know, uh, after Brexit and there's no food coming in, they'll be delivering food by drones as it lands on your head. That's the joke. Um, but if you actually look at that slide, think about what they're into. If you're into transport and distribution, you have a huge amount of power, huge amount of power. Um, and so Amazon are growing at a phenomenal rate and Amazon platform, the cloud, um, if you're, everything's usually on the cloud, most of your photos will be on the cloud. If you're connected to the cloud, um, you'll be part, most other cloud platforms, any platform that uses cloud are all interconnected. So I think I was most horrified when I realized that all university human resources data, 
including your sickness days, your sabbaticals, the time you've had off. Uh, any information is on Salesforce. All your applications, CVs, everything's on Salesforce. That is a shared platform with Amazon. So it's all connected. Amazon have much more share of cloud computing than even China's largest cloud, Alibaba. Big data is really, really, really big and do not underestimate it. The other thing is the entwining, the entanglement, the, the stuck together octopi, whatever, if you can come up with a better metaphor, I'd be very pleased, um, are really, really, really significant because of things like data creep. You think you're giving your information as you hand over a payment for, in a grocery store and the next thing you know, you're on a terrorist list, which is what happened in San Francisco. Likewise, you think you're sending a message to a friend on Facebook and you're being manipulated into political positions by Cambridge Analytica. So, you know, data creep is really, 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 really significant. Uh, again, one of the geniuses of the software world Another master of the evil universe, Peter Thiel, um, who is Donald Trump's tech advisor, was one of the earliest founders in Facebook, set up PayPal because he wanted to deregulate financial systems and destroy any banking unions. He's got a real thing about unions. Um, but um, <clears throat> he has used Palantir, has always been funded by the CIA. So the connections between these companies... You know, people in the Middle East think they were sending a message to their friend and they're all on uh, anti-terrorism lists now. So it's kind of the, the data creep between these systems is really, really, really significant. And they're all done by machine learning. There's very few people who are involved in this until it comes to the very final stages. The good news here is there's very few people have the capacity to analyse this sort of data. But the big firms pay them a huge amount, as we found out with, uh, what's his name, Snowden, a hell of a lot more than CIA does. So the really good guys are the bad guys. Um, this is very significant. Remember, we were doing our research in 2013. In 2015, the Belgian government decided to take on Facebook for illegal tracking. They won the case. And then guess what? They lost it. <laughs> they lost it. And this is why Google, Apple, they're all in Ireland. They lost it because Belgian courts, any national court, does not have international jurisdiction over an Irish company where all data concerning Europe is processed. And that's, if you look at tax law or how tax avoidance works, uh, Ireland's really, really significant. It's incredibly significant for how data works as well. So they effectively can do whatever they like with you. Uh, I just put this on because without people like Carol Calderwalder, the investigative journalist who tracked all the uh, Brexit corruption, uh, we wouldn't know what was going on. Since 2015, since that ruling, since the European Directive, we now know Facebook is still giving Microsoft loads and loads of data. Um, we also know that Amazon uh, gives everybody users names. Yahoo shares friends posts and Facebook has an arrangement with more than 150 companies to provide data. This is when they say they aren't doing it, won't turn up in front of Parliament and when Aaron Banks, one of the richest men in the world, gets fined £150,000 for a data breach. He paid £200,000 for a bottle of champagne so I don't think it's going to bother him at all. So the fines are just a bit pointless. The regulation is not really working. The other thing that I found that's really significant is lobbying. Uh, so much effort goes into lobbying. But in a way, lobbying, if Peter Thiel is your tech advisor, <laughs> does, do you really need to lobby? You're there. So just like all the big banks have the revolving door of government, bank, government, bank, digital companies have exactly the same. They move between. So you can see who they are. So... The significance of this is unavoidable surveillance and capture. Have you got the message? <laughs> surveillance by stealth. No accountability and very difficult to regulate. Remember the stratification between Lara and Bell? So, is this the future? 
What do we do? Digital subprime? Privacy is a positional good? What do we do? It's really, really significant. Massive digital inequality. For those of you who study criminology, predictive policing is kind of one of the biggest cons for just attacking working class people, black and white again. Um, and the classifications, like the classification of waste, are just really, really offensive when you see them. And digital subpriming is really, really significant. It's almost impossible to bring a case against these companies. They basically, Google's policy is bring it on. <laughs> Who's going to take them on? You need a lot of money. And uh, one in five data errors were found to have mistakes. So there are now private companies set up to re-establish your reputation after it has been ruined. So there's a lot of money to be made <laughs> from the errors that are being made. Everything gets privatized. I recommend this book to everybody because I love it. <laughs> and what she shows is this is a whole spiral. For those of you who have children, your children are being tracked and traded. Uh, yeah, on iPads, educational videos. They're being stratified already in terms of are they watching educational quality videos? Are they going to be uh, children of influence? Are they connected to people, potential of influence? Or are they going to be digitally subprimed, connected to those who are involved in criminal activities because their family somewhere in the past has been connected to criminal activities? The levels of stratification that are going on are beginning earlier and earlier. And I'll go, I mean, I don't know what the significance is going to be for the future, but it's going to be really significant. It's called a death spiral of modeling. Yeah. What do you mean digital, digital subprime is where people are just being sold debt or put into a position where they have no value. So they're not going to be sold. Uh, objects like uh, cars or shoes or anything like that, they'll just be sold debt and they will be considered to be a problem. They're called, I had it on there somewhere, uh, potential threats. So if they're in a particular area, live in a particular area, have particular families, have those who've had problems, have families who've bought debt, the chances are they'll be in debt. So it kind of starts stratifying children before they even get into education. Now, she used to be a coder. She worked for one of these companies and kind of just had a moral crisis and shows how it's all done, shows how um, there's what's called digital uh, subprime universities in the US that are sold to people who've been identified as never having had access to any education. They're targeted because their families know nothing about education and they're told, go to this university, you'll get a good degree. And what happens is the university doesn't give them a good degree, charges them huge amount of fees and then collapses. Uh, this was only found out about, and it's in this book, when the Trump University was prosecuted. So we know this is kind of high power connection. So this book I would recommend to everybody. Um, that's just to remind you how big the tracking infrastructure is because it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And have a look at Crack Labs if you need the images. I think these are significant. What does this stuff make us do? And I think these are new forms of control. So it's not just about new forms of capitalism. It's new forms of power, new forms of control. We're habituated when every single element of our life has been tracked, traded, and monetized. What do we do? Our habits change, everything changes. And nearly all of our time has been converted into the interests for consumption. And so <coughs> we found out when we did the interviews, most people are just resigned. There's nothing you can do. But there is. <laughs> I'm coming to that bit. There are things we can do. But I do think if we're sociologists, we need to think these are new forms of power. If we're economists, these are new forms of capitalism. Uh, these are actually re restructuring and reshaping what we do. So basically, they do have the power to just extract profit from our whole existence, not just from our labor. In fact, uh, most of it isn't labor. Most of it's when we're sitting on a sofa watching TV, <laughs> playing with our phones. It's not a traditional model of exploitation. 
So it's about the power to extract profit from existence, from the performance of our subjectivity. So what do we do? The grand challenge. <laughs> Get through it quite quickly. <laughs> what to do? So this is what I used to suggest. We have to make technology fit us. First of all, don't let them into your house. Preemptive capture, designed for the military. They're listening to you. They are working out what you're saying. They're recording everything you say, everything you do. Do not let them in. Would you let the military into your house to record every moment? No. So, and if it says smart, be really, really worried, because they are. They're really, really smart. That's what it means. So don't accommodate that which wants to monetize your space. This is what I used to say, minimize information given. We used to try and confuse them. We used to have a lot of fun obfuscating things. But now it's very difficult to do that. They have everything on you. When you change your phone number, they know. It's really, really, really hard. And we tried to do this. And I, 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 I propose that you all attempt to do this. Try it. See how hard it is. And this will teach you how much we've all been habituated. It's so difficult. Take it away. Turn it off. I've tried to take phones off people and they get very upset, very distressed. Avoid all online shopping. Hmm. Yep. Avoid. Well, you have to use ATMs. It's very hard. Use cash. Learn to hack and code. Really hard. Uh, change the device identifier on your phone if you can. Go dumb. Use a really old phone. You know, you've seen the wire. <laughs> um, and turn them off. Actually, that does help. They still track you when you turn them back on, but, you know, turning them off is quite a good thing. Um, and a lot of these activities, have you noticed in the Sunday sub supplements, there's all these now Google uh, software engineers who are recommending uh, addiction support and all this sort of stuff. The people who've designed these, these things to habituate you, to trap you, are now going, ah, what have we done? So, you know, the man who designed the scroll down on Twitter, he really regrets it. Um, so, you know, there's all that. But you could read your privacy policies, but that's a bit pointless because... It will take you years, years and years and years. So it's not an individual issue, really. And I think that's the solution we've come to. This is not an individual problem. This is a big social problem. This is about the reorganization of many things. So what about lots of people have proposed regulating and nationalizing? Well... <laughs> The European Data Initiative has had some effect, but mainly on small companies. Google, Facebook, and Amazon have got away with everything so far because you've already agreed it because you have automatic updates on usually. Um, so, and they ask you questions in a very particular way. Nationalization would be a really good idea if we had a government who hasn't sold more of our data than any other government, more than Trump, more than America. This is the worst protected nation for data apart from India in the world. So nationalization by this government, I don't think so. They pay Facebook more than they get off them in tax. So maybe that's not quite right. And they give all the IP patents a subsidy. So I don't think so. Don't think that's going to happen. So what do we do? How do we control the state trading of data. If it's not an individual problem, it's a state problem, what do we do? The Indian government sold all of its citizens' data to French and British intelligence agencies. If you don't believe me, look at WikiLeaks. Uh, it's the ADAR system, biometric system. We know that the US was actually tracking Germany. So, you know, what does a, what does a nation state do if Germany can't protect its own politicians? And we know that the UK government basically employ the companies that are tracking and trading our data to protect us from the tracking and trading of data. Is that going to work? I don't think so. And there's some really, really brilliant work by Eugenie Mozarov where he says, you know, it's the same companies that they're the only ones with the capacity to uh, do the regulation are the ones who are actually doing all the trading and tracking. So what do we do? 
and the, the entwinement between companies, Palantir and the CIA, Cambridge Analytica and the British Tory party, what do we do? Do we know, what do we do when there's so much data creep and states are collecting data? So this is beyond individual control and national control. We do need to attempt to force, ooh, uh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. We do need to attempt to force governments to regulate in some way. And I'm going to suggest that in a minute. Before that, I am going to suggest blockers and confusers. Track me not, pretty good, not brilliant. Ghostly used to be really good, but then it sells a lot of data onto a security company called Everall, I think it is. Go to anything organized by tactical tech. They're brilliant, and they do have visuals that are huge, and they keep monitoring Google, and they get some funding from Mozilla, which is all open source. Use Mozilla, don't use Safari. Don't use Google Chrome, the best tracker there is. Um, so anything by Tactical Technology Collective. And then finally, educate, activate, and organize. That's all we can do. And that's what I'm doing. So find out what's happening to your data. Take some time out. Think about who's, you know, look at who's tracking it and what they're doing with it. Support research in this area. Uh, yeah, really, really important. Very hard to do, but it's really, really worth doing. Lobby governments to prosecute those who use social media for political purposes. Nothing's really happened as a result of Cambridge Analytica and the manipulation of the Brexit vote. Nothing apart from a £150,000 fine, which to me is completely shocking. You can have a drama made about it, but nothing else happens. Corruption at the core. Organise against monopolies. Now, I think this is a really good idea. Break them up. The robber barons of the 1920s who owned the distribution networks of the time, railways, had to be broken up. Their monopolies were broken up and they were regulated through very different parts. They've got to be broken up and they should not be given tax subsidies. Very important things. Also, organise for children to be protected. People are looking at content to protect children from content, but they should be looking to protect children from tracking. It's not the content, it's the tracking that's really, really important. And do everything that you possibly can, because this is the present and our future. Thank you.